In this first lesson, we will zoom out to look at the bigger ecosystem in which legal visuals exist. What is the context for this specific type of legal information format? And what does research tell us about its benefits and problems? Several trends are leading towards the increased attention for legal visualization. These trends all express a forward-thinking creative mindset with the intention to make things work better for the people who need these things. With our reliance on screen interfaces for information, the field of user experience design has grown tremendously. This is a multidisciplinary profession that works with information architecture, information design and cognitive psychology. Once you look at an information display on a screen, you need to assume there is a place for user experience design. The overlap with legal visualization is in the focus on user friendliness. Access to justice is a global field of practice that aims to give underserved groups better access to fair legal resolution, including court systems and alternative dispute resolution. For underserved groups, you can think of low income, women, youth, people with disabilities, people of color, GLBTQ people, people with trauma, rural access, internet access, and the various intersectionalities. The overlap with legal visualization is in the focus on accessibility of legal information. The integrative law movement is a worldwide international movement of lawyers who have a systemic perspective. They see law as a part of bigger systems and are design thinkers. They reflect as individuals and together, seeking a world that works for all. Integrative lawyers tend to bring their whole selves, body, mind, soul and emotions to work together to create a better legal system. This mindset has sprouted many innovative approaches and practices for serving the needs of legal clients and legal professionals. For example, restorative justice, conscious contracts, sharing law and earth jurisprudence. The overlap with legal visualization is in the focus on design thinking and systems thinking. As we have seen, legal visualization fits in a broader context. The research on cognitive processing, visual learning, plain language, design and accessibility could easily fill several college courses, a minor or even a major. So here we can only skim the surface. Are pictures really worth a thousand words? What are the key arguments for using visual information over plain text? Humans have an evolutionary bias towards the visual. Evolutionary biologists stress that rapid and intense reaction to environmental visual stimuli was an important survival mechanism. Visual stimuli were warning humans about threats before language or certainly writing were even known. In the attention economy, cognitive overload is our baseline and attention is a scarce and precious resource. Attention seems to be a very literal process. Images are eye-catching and from there activate our evolutionary visual superpower. Once a picture catches our eye, we rapidly process it and give it meaning. The human brain can process entire images that the eye sees for as little as 13 milliseconds. According to research compiled by 3M, the corporation behind post-it notes, visuals are processed 60,000 times faster than text, which means you can paint a picture for your audience much faster with an actual picture. Images are especially effective at activating associations. If you spark an experience or memory with your image, you can convey meaning that goes well beyond the picture itself. And last, the picture superiority effect. It has to do with the way that we encode and learn information. Some research claims that infographics increase the willingness to read by 80%. And another compelling percentage, people following directions with text and illustrations do over 300% better than those following directions without illustrations. I would add a side note to that. It depends. It depends on the quality of the design. It also depends on the complexity of the concept that the image represents. A picture of an apple is easier to grasp than an architectural plan for a new museum. Edward Tufte published many highly respected books on information design to develop a sensibility to distinguish between junk charts and functional infographics. To summarize, we humans have great visual fluency, yet critical visual literacy is a learned skill that works best in combination with subject matter expertise. For the purposes of this online course, we have to zoom in and refine the scope. 
I will focus the rest of this module on specific research on legal visuals, the intersection of law and visualization. Although legal information design is a newly developing branch on the legal tree, there already is a significant research base. This includes many interesting critical questions for further development. The following overview is far from complete, but hopefully it will invite you to follow the threads that speak most to you. Several scholars have recognized that visual law has a fundamental impact on the structure of law. It does not simply change the layout or look and feel of legal documents, but instead it changes how lawyers construct law, how lawyers practice law, and how users of law engage with it, how law serves them or not. It's not just about packaging, it's about the substance of law and legal practice. Two examples. Professor Neil Feigenson teaches visual persuasion in the law at Quinnipiac University. He published widely on the cognitive and social psychology of legal decision making and the uses of visual and multimedia evidence. He claims visuals deconstruct and reconstruct legal knowledge. I quote, visual displays construct legal knowledge in new ways. He identifies three dimensions of legal visuality that create tensions in our conceptions of what law and legal knowledge should be. One, the flood of visual imagery in the courtroom to be interpreted within a word-based jurisprudence. He is concerned with the fact that most courtroom visuals disappear without a trace and thereby cannot become part of analysis in appeals and academic research. Visuals are nested in word-based legal arguments. Second, how images create beliefs. He states that the task for any legal visual theory will be to study further the epistemological and psychological fault lines between the various roots of visual knowledge. The third dimension, how imagery from popular culture influences may affect concepts of justice. He is concerned about visual tainting. Visual technologies let advocates appeal to their audiences using the media as well as the mentalities of popular culture shaping how we believe that stories are supposed to go, on TV and in movies. His call to action, first for legal actors and institutions to do the boundary work, needed to preserve and validate legal justice as sufficiently distinct from the popular, and secondly for courts to reach further into the broader culture for guidance in examining the visual with wisdom and creativity. The next example of a scholar who has pointed out how visual law has a fundamental impact on the structure of law is Professor Bernard Hibbets at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. His work is so good, get a cup of coffee and lean back for some story time. Unfortunately, it did not come as a picture book. He gives an overview of the many ways in which visuals have become part of legal practice in and outside the courtroom in education and in legal language itself, in the form of metaphors. He finds that there has been little comprehensive consideration of law's newfound visuality. He suggests that this may be caused by fear, uncertainty and ignorance. For many lawyers, the pictorial turn equals a turn towards the unknown and the unfamiliar. Hibbets exposes several facets of this fear. At some level, he suggests, Lawyers may also be concerned about the impact that pictures and images will have on their own cognitive practices. What he writes on the social and hierarchical dynamics within the legal profession is striking. To quote him, many lawyers are wary of pictures and images because of the challenge which greater reliance on those media would likely present to established hierarchies. Inside the legal community, making more use of pictures and images would seem to favor supposedly second-class professional groups, which are less verbally or textually oriented, or whose members have resisted full indoctrination into logocentrism. For example, trial attorneys whose visual antics and exhibits make good television stand to gain professional stature in an imagistic legal culture. While the current high priest of the bar, appellate lawyers who deal in written briefs, make very limited oral presentations and do not deal in visual evidence, stand to lose status in their process. Women and minority attorneys could also benefit from a pictorial turn, as they come from gender and ethnic cultures which have historically been prevented from privileging the textual. 
In this context, it's interesting to note that women and minority law professors have already shown themselves to be relatively more open to the experimental use of pictures and images in legal scholarship. Outside the legal community, using more pictures and images might alter the traditional imbalance of power between professional lawyers on the one hand and clients and lay people on the other. Law presented by visual means will likely be more understandable and accessible, not only to persons with limited textual skills or persons with a limited ability to interpret legal verbiage, but to the public as a whole. In a more imagistic environment, lawyers may find not only that they retain less of a monopoly on legal information, but that they have less social power as the verbal base of their authority is eroded." End quote. Please notice that this article was published in 1996, 25 years ago. It still sounds strikingly relevant in 2021. It exposes dynamics that we now may be more open to discuss. Yet, I find that lawyers still tend to lead with more legalistic concerns than a fear of uprooting their professional hierarchy and status. Hibbert's perspective is aligned with the core vision of the work we teach at Legal Visuals Academy. He articulates why this work matters, and I'm again reading from his work here. The pictorial turn may make the bar a more welcoming and more comfortable place for formerly marginalized persons whose gender, ethnic or other backgrounds have sensitized them to the relevance and power of images. The pictorial turn may also help to reconnect the legal community to the general public, which has felt increasingly alienated from lawyers, as lawyers have increasingly focused their attention on the fine print of the law instead of on the faces and visible predicaments of people. For most people, law grounded in pictures and images would also be more alive, more interested and more memorable, allowing individuals to more effectively retain and internalize the law, making it their own instead of something that exists apart from them on a shelf. Professor Hibbets offers a wonderful suggestion for a visual will, recorded on video. Permitting this would literally set the author on the center stage of the law, instead of leaving them a subscriber to a written document drafted by someone else. The recorded image of the living testator personally favoring some beneficiaries and not others might even help to reduce the number of contested wills. This article, which reads like a manifesto, ends with a call to action, a call for learning and multidisciplinary collaboration. Lawyers and other members of the legal community need to act now to make the transition more palatable and ultimately more useful. In the first place, we need to educate ourselves about the pictorial so that we can appreciate its possibilities and potential as much as its dangers. One of the core distinctions to make at a theoretical level is that of the function of legal visualization. Explanatory or normative? Supplemental or substantive? Legal visuals, as used in this course, are supplemental graphics. They include infographics, images and symbols to illustrate, organize and communicate legal ideas more effectively. They exist in the realm of communication about law. In that sense, they are meta-law. Normative and substantive are visual images that express legal norms as such and have direct effect as such. The most obvious examples are traffic signs maps that are part of zoning restrictions, or icons and images that have been registered as part of intellectual property. Images that consist of evidence could be positioned somewhere in between, depending on the system of evidentiary law in your country or legal jurisdiction. I don't want to make a generalized statement on this topic. Legal visualization may sound like a new invention, but it certainly is not. It predates the written traditions of law and still has a place in societies with oral traditions. Colette Brunswick of the University of Zurich has developed in-depth research on the visual history of law in its many forms. She is responsible for the content management of the Legal Image Database held by the Legal Visualization Unit. Her research focuses on the law as a visual, audiovisual and ultimately multisensory phenomenon. She draws on various legal disciplines, such as legal education, legal iconography, legal informatics, legal psychology, legal sociology, and legal theory. The University of Oslo, Norway, has done an interdisciplinary research project on the relations between law and visuality, with a strong historic dimension, but also including philosophy. See this reference to Richard Rorty. 
suggesting that creative expressions might be a valuable resource to look at understanding of law and justice throughout history. Legal visualizations are widely used in legal practice. My frame of reference comes from an American and a Dutch point of view. Legal practice in your country may be using these types of visuals more or less. The American legal culture has a significant difference through its system of jury litigation. However, this is not as pervasive as non-American lawyers tend to think. Yes, jury trials are common in both civil and criminal cases, both at the county court and district court level. And most cases are completed outside of court, for example, based on a plea agreement or by a judge only, if parties choose to decline a jury trial. Even for professional judge-only courts, like we know in most European countries that are not common law based, visuals can be extremely helpful. They may educate, inform and persuade on complex technical facts, as well as on the perception and construction of arguments. In the Netherlands, courtroom presentations and courtroom graphics are becoming an accepted practice. The Dutch design culture is receptive to adopt legal graphics in other areas, outside of the courtroom. We have trained many lawyers in the public and private sector to embed graphics in their legal documents, legislative process flowcharts, policy reports, contracts and presentations, whether they are intended for the general public, internal clients or decision makers. Compared to the legal culture in the United States, this adoption is moving quicker. In the United States, there is wide attention for visuals as part of legal tech tools and access to justice solutions. Argument diagramming and logic mapping is a field of its own and stretches beyond legal reasoning into mathematical reasoning, knowledge engineering and artificial intelligence. It's also used in education, even for young children in the form of graphic organizers and software such as Rationale and Kialo. Mind mapping is a more free flow, non-linear form of visual note taking and visual information organization. It is widely used in legal practice as a case management and knowledge management technique. For example, MindMeister and IOA, formerly iMindMap, which was developed by Tony Buzen, who made mind mapping well known. Some excellent applied research has been done by Finnish information designer Stefania Passera and Finnish lawyer Helena Hapio. Their work concentrates on visual contracts. Passera's doctoral dissertation is titled Beyond the Wall of Contract Text visualizing contracts to foster understanding and collaboration within and across organizations. They have also established a network of European legal information designers and have created a worldwide pattern library for visual contracting frameworks. Access to justice is embedded in and informed by insights of legal sociology and the specific factors that determine different unequitable justice outcomes for various groups of participants in the legal system. Self-help assistance is one dimension to level the playing field. The Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System has done excellent applied research on best practices for user-friendly legal self-help materials. Many of the benefits we have seen thus far can be transferred to legal education, Visuals help abstract thinking, reasoning, argumentation, research. Basically all the skills that we recognize across the board as core legal skills. In addition, legal visualization can be part of an integrated curriculum for applied skills, to function well as a lawyer in legal practice and to participate in problem solving and innovation. Another way to look at it, the communication and consulting skills that make a lawyer from good to great. Let's look at a few example programs that have emerged at law schools. At the University of Baltimore School of Law, Assistant Professor Colin Starger has launched a project aimed at visually mapping Supreme Court doctrine. His SCOTUS mapping project combines sophisticated software with principles of information design to chart the relationships among the court's opinions, with the goal of enhancing teaching and scholarship about the court. The New York Law School has offered a course since 2001, Visual Persuasion in the Law, created by visual pioneers Richard Sherwin and Christina Spiegel. The Department of Law, University of Basel, Switzerland, developed a course entitled Better Understanding the Law Through Schematizations of the General Provisions of the Swiss Code of Obligations. The students learn how they can use charts to promote better understanding of the subject matter. 
Apart from critically evaluating existing schemes, the students will, as a team, produce and evaluate their own schemes. The faculty of the Law School of the University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, receive training in implementing legal visualization in their academic courses. The Bachelor Program in Applied Legal Sciences in Utrecht, the Netherlands, is offering a minor in legal design thinking and has published an educational book, Basics of Legal Design. The Legal Design Lab is an interdisciplinary team based at Stanford Law School and D School, building a new generation of legal products and services. One of their strengths is user-centered empirical research. Jessica Silby has expressed the following concern in her article, Images in slash of law. Images do not speak for themselves. Advocates and audience, be they juries or judges, speak for them. With images quickly becoming the common currency in legal knowledge, we must learn to scrutinize images in language we can each understand and upon which we can each agree. You will find the link in the resources section. Tanya Lehman of Flinders University, Adelaide, Australia, has written an excellent overview of the implications of legal visualization. Her 2016 article is titled, Where are the graphics? Communicating legal ideas effectively using images and symbols. She ends her article with a call to action in the form of critical reflection. Given these difficulties of encapsulating, applying, defining and interpreting the meaning of images in a predictable, precise, detailed and certain way, careful thought needs to be given by lawyers, legal educators and law students as to when and how visualization tools can and should be used to accurately communicate complex legal ideas and information. The next three slides will show you highly recommended books and resources for further reading. Thank you very much for your attention and your participation.